Hello and welcome to the last in our short series of lectures on cognition for Cognition in the Brain module. Now today's topic is language. <clears throat> but before I talk too much about the cognitive process that is language, I'd just like to remind you um, of what some of what we covered in last time's lecture on perception. So the first thing we looked at really was to make this distinction between what's called sensation and what we call perception. Hopefully you remember that sensation is basically only the reception within the human body, within the brain typically, of information from the outside world. Now we looked particularly at visual <clears throat> Uh, sense and there the sensation is just the information that's contained in the light waves that fall on the back of our eye on the retina and are initially coded, encoded into electronic signals by the rod and cone cells that are in the back of our eye. Everything that's done with that information after that initial encoding into the brain is what we call perception or at least perceptual processing and what we end up with from this information that just falls on our back of our eye on the retina is this feeling, this perception that we have that we can really see and visualise a 3D, 3D world with depth and objects in it um, <clears throat> that we can make out to be distinct shapes and patterns and objects. And because that isn't how seeing feels to us, it doesn't feel like we are doing an awful lot of um, cognitive processing to create this very vivid, detailed 3D image. It feels very natural and normal. It looks like we just open our eyes and we see what is there. We looked at a number of different um, visual illusions to show how actually the way we perceive the world does have a lot of quite complex processing um, behind it and that cognitive processing is often automatic which is why it feels like we're not doing it at all it feels like we're just opening our eyes and looking but actually it is there and because it's automatic we can't also step in and prevent it it means we are subject to these sorts of visual illusions which deliberately um, manipulate our automatic processing to give us a very different and unusual um, perception of the world. <clears throat> okay, so that's a little bit of an overview of last week's lecture. So how does it link in with language? Well, I think at a very simple um, comparison is that language is clearly a very high level process. So it, it does have that similarity to perception. Perception is definitely a high level process. We do a lot of processing even though it doesn't feel like that. And language is of that type as well. Now although often language feels like it's quite complex, as you can hear me talking, I'm having to think about the words I'm using to make sure I don't misspeak, so it does feel less automatic and more deliberate. Actually there's a lot of effects that, that, that our language processes have on us that actually are quite automatic. We looked at that a little bit in the um, <clears throat> lecture on attention where we saw that actually in something like the Stroop task, even though you're not required to read the word and in certain conditions reading what the word says will actually interfere and make the task of naming the colour ink the word is printed in more difficult, you can't help yourself stop, stop. You can't help but help yourself um, read, read the word. <clears throat> so this is another example of where language processing, although it does feel often quite complex and quite high level, at times it's also automatic and can lead to certain um, side effects, if you like, um, that perhaps weren't what you intended. <clears throat> language is also very important to us because it allows us perhaps to describe our perceptions to others. So what I'm seeing now in my visual field, you obviously can't see, 
but I could describe it to you and relate it to you, and you probably could get a very clear understanding of what it is that I see um, behind the um, computer screen right now because of the way I use my language and the way that you understand that language. <clears throat> so that's enough of a kind of introduction. Let's talk about um, in some more detail what we're actually going to cover in today's lecture. So first of all, we're just going to have a little bit of a <clears throat> look at perhaps different definitions of what language is and try and get perhaps a more formal idea of what we mean by language. Then we're going to look at a question that has been debated for quite a long time within psychology and indeed within uh, psycholinguistics um, and arguably is still um, being debated today, hasn't been settled. And that's the question of whether language, under certain definitions of what language is, is, is that form of communication that is language unique to humans? Can other non-human species have language or are they able to acquire language? So we'll look at that question. Then we'll move on to <clears throat> another area of um, psycholinguistics, which is really about um, how language shapes our thoughts. Um, without being fully aware of it, I guess, um, we actually do think in words, um, or at least I know I do, when I am thinking of through a problem or struggling over an issue, I'll often hear an internal dialogue or internal monologue going on in my head. Um, it's my own internal voice, um, but it is, for want of a better word, speaking. It's using verbal language to go through the problem, to think out different potential solutions, and, um, and therefore I think in language. Um, then we'll just end with a quick summary of what we went through today and also in conjunction with what you'll do in the additional reading that supplements and adds to this uh, lecture what you should be able to take away from your very brief look at um, the cognitive process that is language. <clears throat> so there's a number of different definitions of what language is. Um, Martin et al. came up with um, language definition of it is a system of symbols which have meaning to the user and the recipient. A similar definition perhaps could be given by um, Harley, which is that systems or language is a system of symbols and rules that enables, enable us to communicate. So they're both very similar. They're both are referring to some form of symbol system. Now again, when we hear the word symbols, um, perhaps we think of written symbols. We're thinking of words, possibly pictograms in, in Egyptian hieroglyphics, something like that. But actually, um, spoken language could also be thought of as symbols. The, the sound symbols that when I say book, you do immediately think of that thing that we all um, refer to as a book, like something with pages, has a cover, that contains information. So I think these definitions often might imply or, or, or lend themselves more easily to describe written language, but they could equally, and in fact need to, equally apply to verbal language. Now, Martin's definition also focuses on the fact that this, 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 this system of symbols not only has to have meaning, which obviously it does, so when I say book, that means something to you, you're aware of the concept of what a book is, but also we have to have a shared understanding of that word. So it has to have meaning to me, the user of the language, and you, the recipient of the language. Now, um, if I'm assuming that none of you speak um, Portuguese, so if I said the word livro, then you don't share the meaning of that symbol, that word, verbal word, um, with me, and therefore it might not have any meaning to you. Now, if some of you speak French, then livre sounds very much uh, similar to livre, which of course is book in French uh, and is book in Spanish, uh, sorry, Portuguese. Um, so you might be able to understand what I mean, but again, that's because we now have 
a loosely connected but shared meaning of the word and through a, a, a third language, if you like. Um, so that's an important part of um, the Martin definition. Harley, however, focuses on this idea of the system of symbols has rules associated with it. So that's things like in <clears throat> the English language, at least, you need at least two um, structures to be able to form a sentence. She must have um, an action, a verb, and you must have a, um, a subject, i.e. who's doing that action. So um, people often refer to the fact that perhaps one of the shortest sentences in the English language comes from the Bible, and it's the phrase, Jesus wept. So you know what Jesus is doing, he's weeping, and you know that the person doing the weeping is Jesus. So again, you've got your two minimum um, requirements to form to conform to the rule, make a sentence that then makes sense and give us the full amount of information. Um, other rules relate to word order, the way you conjugate the verb, etc., etc. So they can be very complex rules, um, there can be many of them, but there's no doubt that within any specific language, the rules must be um, understood and shared between people. Um, also, Harley, because he says that language is something that enables us to communicate. We've also got now a slight distinction, perhaps a bit like the sensation versus perception distinction we saw last week, and that is that language is a very um, specific form of communication. So it's, if you like, a subset of communication. So all language helps us communicate, but not all communication is language. There are some other forms of communication, typically simpler forms, which we wouldn't describe as being language. And we'll look a little bit about why that might be um, later on. So thinking through all that, we can basically say, well, language is a formal system of symbols and rules <clears throat> that allow this complex form of communication that we know as language. As I said earlier, if you use the term symbols, people often just think about written or visual language, but that's not necessarily the case. We can think about verbal language, spoken language, visual language that is writing, but also visual language such as sign language, um, etc. <clears throat> then another distinction came in um, that perhaps language, there are other forms of communication that are language, but also, although language is clearly a form of communication, it isn't the only function of language. Actually, you don't have to use, be using language in order to communicate. You can lose it for, use it for other reasons. And in particular, we think about how we record information. We typically have verbal memories sometimes. Um, and we also use it to think. And I referred to that earlier, where I certainly have an internal voice that is my internal thinking voice, if you like that I can hear inside my head when I'm thinking something through and it helps me understand concepts and think through problems and that clearly I'm using language. <clears throat> However, I'm not actually communicating um, to a third party. Um, another way of thinking about language is that it's a shared system of often abstract labels and concepts. So this is the idea that actually, although I use a book to mean that thing with paper, that thing that contains information, it could be a storybook, it could be a textbook, there's all different types of book. Um, it's actually quite an abstract label that we have for the word book. Um, it certainly could be called other things in other languages. Um, and actually, where if we decide to call a book a thingamabob, then provided that we all agree that, next time I say, now, in your text thingamabobs, You'll find, a, you'll find the required reading, you'd still be able to understand me. It's actually slightly um, arbitrary what the labels are. It can also be quite abstract. I can talk about things that, you, that aren't very concrete using words and labels. I can talk about some of our emotions. Um, what is it? What is sadness? 
what is happiness? It's very difficult to really tie down and define, but through our own experience, we all kind of understand the concept that I'm describing with those labels. And I guess the last thing to say about language is it is incredibly important. Um, it's, it's probably the biggest factor that has enabled human development to um, go as far as it has and indeed to continue going. It's by having language that we're able to write knowledge down, store knowledge, pass it from generation to generation, work together as teams because we share those common um, concepts and are able to communicate. Um, so it's been incredibly important in the history of humankind. Okay, so <clears throat> I talked earlier about that um, not all communication is language. There are some forms of communication that don't meet the definition of the language. And a number of people have attempted to define what sorts of features that a language has these other forms of communication perhaps don't. And um, again, in your textbook, there's um, a very uh, detailed list uh, given by, originally by Pocket, that looks at the sorts of design features that human language has to have. I won't go through them all because, again, they're described in some detail very well in the directed reading, but I'll just pick out a few. So first of all, there's this idea of semanticity. Um, this is the idea that words, or indeed labels, that we talk about, such as the word book, has a meaning. Um, it has semantic uh, connotations, content. If I say the word book, you will think about what we generally agree as a book. Um, similarly, if I say a car, you will think about a metal box, probably on four wheels, with an engine that allows you to go from um, location A to location B. Again, you may have specific <clears throat> um, ideas in mind. You might be thinking about your own car. You might be thinking about a particularly sporty car. Someone might be thinking about you know, um, a more family car. It doesn't matter. The point is that we share the general meaning um, of what a car is. Then we move on to arbitrariness. So again, this is the idea that actually, once we have the concept of what we mean by a car, as long as we all agree that this is now the la new label for it, it doesn't have to be called a car. It could be called anything. And it's quite arbitrary what label gets assigned to the concept, the semantic idea of a particular thing. <clears throat> There's then this idea of there being structure dependence. This is a little bit talking about perhaps the rules of grammar. So this is the idea that the word order can very deliberately, very importantly, change the meaning of the sentence, even though you've got exactly the same words in the sentence. So a classic example might be, John chased the dog. So again, just a very simple four-word sentence. But you have an idea, perhaps, of um, a little boy playing with his puppy, and the puppy um, kind of runs away, and John chases after it because he wants to give him a stroke or a cuddle or whatever it might be. Now, if I change the word order, and instead of saying John chased the dog, I say the dog chased John, you've suddenly got the actions completely the other way around. So now the dog is chasing John. Now, again, they, he still could be that playful puppy, and John could just be pretending to run away from him to get him to chase after him. Or, because of that word change, you also then could have a very different um, kind of conceptual idea of what's going on. Suddenly, John might be, you know, um, perhaps a burglar, and this dog, you know, a big rock viler, and he's defending the home, and now he's quite aggressively chasing off after John, trying to uh, catch him. But certainly, the idea of what's happening to whom um, changes dramatically if you just swap the word order around like that. There's plenty of other examples. There's this idea also um, of creativity, which is although we do have clear rules, rules of syntax, rules of grammar about um, how you can form a sentence, how you can um, communicate information in any particular language, whilst you must comply to the rules, there's also infinite options. You could think of um, a new sentence that makes sense in the English language 
that possibly has never been spoken before. So, something like, I don't know, um, William carried an Aspidistra plant along the road, uh, also leading an elephant by the lead, and he went into the pizza shop. Now, okay, that's pretty unlike, unlikely to have really happened, but you can certainly understand it, you can certainly get the information that I'm conveying, and yet such an unlikely set of events, I doubt that anyone said that sentence before in the world. Um, maybe they have, how can you tell? But my point is, you really can come up with an absolute infinite number of um, new forms of um, communication in your language, even though they all adhere to these rules of syntax and grammar. And finally, this is a little bit linked to this issue of um, abstractness, that we can use language um, in a dis displaced way. And that means I can talk about something that, that is remote from you and indeed from me in both space and time. So I can talk about things that happened yesterday, 300 years ago in history. I can talk about things that might be happening in the future. I can talk about things that happened you know, to me here in my own personal space. I can talk about things that happen in different countries, perhaps even in different um, parts of the universe, the galaxy, whatever. Because we have these objects, <coughs> kind of um, these concepts that we can then give labels, we can then, and they become very abstract, um, we can then refer to things that are um, not currently present in front of us, um, but maybe remote in space and time. So that's a really important aspect of language. As I said, I won't go through them all. Again, they're not even all on the slide, but you will find them um, discussed very well in the directive reading. And so that brings us on to um, the directive reading, and they, that is chapter 15 of Davy and chapters 9 to 11 um, of Isaac and Keane. Um, uh, sorry for the typo on the screen, it says the reading accompany this perception lecture, obviously that should be the reading to accompany this language lecture. Anyway, um, I've certainly so far tried to imply or try to make sure I cover all form, potential forms of language, um, both verbal and written and sign language and things like that. And what I would also say is that these texts cover particularly how we produce spoken and written language and how we understand them and comprehend them, which is a very, very important part of um, the cognitive processing of language. But I really don't have time to cover those um, particular aspects. So again, doing the reading is really important because there's a lot um, of basic knowledge that you need to cover, um, which I just can't fit into this lecture. Okay. So let's move on to um, the idea of language and animals. Well, as I said before, one of the questions that's really continued to be debated within psychology and psycholinguistics is whether the ability to use and manipulate language is really unique to humans. Is it only humans that can do this? Certainly we know it's very important to humans, it's the basis of our knowledge, how we pass information from one person to another, from prior generations to current generations and future generations, and we're clearly very able to do it um, relative to our non-human cousins. But that doesn't mean necessarily it's unique to humans. The other thing I would say is that a very famous um, psycholinguistics uh, linguist, Noam Chomsky, um, in the US, talked about humans having a particularly innate ability to use language. It doesn't mean that they necessarily have an innate language, but they have an in innate ability to use language. And the suggestion is, perhaps, that the other non-human species don't have this innate ability, or at least nothing like as strong or as um, clear innate ability. Now to answer the question of whether um, 
language is unique to humans, one of the ways, and the most common way that people have tried to answer this, is take a non-human um, animal and try to get them to learn a language to speak with a language, um, or at least communicate with a language. Now, most of the research has been done on primates, primates, apes, monkeys, um, etc. And that's because they are our closest cousins um, genetically, so they probably are the most likely to be able to do something that we think may be um, special to humans. It's also they've also done work on parrots and dolphins, etc. But um, primates are the most likely. Um, Kellogg and Kellogg had a primate called Gua, and perhaps um, that's one of the first primate studies. There was also um, Vicky in the 1950s. Um, I won't go through the whole list, but again, um, a lot of these um, primates are really quite famous. Um, Washo, for instance, by Gardner and Gardner, was, was a taught, or at least partly taught, um, American Sign Language. The initial studies um, in the 30s, 40s and 50s with primates was actually trying to get them to speak, to vocalise um, language. And they largely ended in, um, in, in complete failure. And we think that's because that the structure of the voice box in primates just isn't um, able to carry out the quite subtle vocalisations that are needed in the human spoken language. So then we move to things like sign language with Washoe, the idea of using coloured chips or coloured symbols to represent certain objects or certain actions. Um, and then we moved on to um, a primate called Nim Chimpsky, um, which was deliberately um, a misspelling uh, of Noam Chomsky because it was an attempt to prove Noam Chomsky wrong that in fact a chimpanzee called Nim could use language. Okay, so that's a little bit of a history of, of the research. What we're going to do now is very quickly watch a couple of videos that um, show quite a famous um, gorilla, in fact, uh, um, uh, by the name of uh, Coco, um, and you can just see her at least using um, some form of communication um, before we discuss whether that really is language. So the first video is very short, and um, well, I'll let you watch that, and then we'll go straight into a second video, um, which has been taken from uh, a US documentary. So here's the first, vi first video. But I brought Coco Nipple. Nipple has Coco's. Love, okay, let's take this baby out my hand. You love. Drink? Where does the baby drink? Drink, the baby signs she's got a giant mouth. Drink mouth. She said the baby answer. The baby said drink mouth. That's right. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed that. You clearly could see, at least to some extent, that there was some understanding between the human and um, Coco, although it's really debatable whether the understanding was as clear as you might expect it to be if she could fully understand language. Um, she clearly had a lot of affection for the, the, the little doll um, and clearly understood the concept of drink, but whether it was... Um, really understand the nuances of where does the doll drink, i.e. its mouth, or where does the doll drink from, i.e. because it's a, perhaps it's a baby, it's um, Coco's nipple, um, because that's where it gets its milk from, is, is a bit debatable, and we're not quite clear how, there's clearly some transfer of understanding, there's some communication there, but was it really as precise and specific form that we need before we can say, yes, Coco can speak, at least to some extent, this language. Okay, we're now going to move on to the second video. As I say, this has been taken from 
an extract from a um, US documentary and it's still Coco the gorilla um, and this time um, she's interacting with the actor Robin Williams. So again I'll just let you watch that. <laughs> communicating with a gorilla. Her name is Coco. We shared something extraordinary. Laughter. Coco understands spoken English and uses over a thousand signs to share her feelings and thoughts about daily events. Life, love, even death. It was awesome and unforgettable. I'm going to adopt you. <laughs> Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that video. Um, there's no doubt that in watching that video you can see that Coco is intelligent, there's a lot of understanding um, going on there um, 
by the gorilla and in, indeed between um, the humans around Coco and Coco herself. Um, but clearly the ability that Coco has to use language is relatively limited. She's able to say certain things, actions such as tickle or go outside, play, but it's not clear whether she's asking Robin Williams to tickle her, whether she wants to tickle Robin Williams. There's a, there's, there is some lack of specificity, if you like, about the language that Coco is using. Um, so while some people still believe that examples like Coco um, suggest that some animal species can be taught language such that it clearly isn't unique to humans. Other people would argue, well, it's really not of a good enough level of, of ability to really say they actually speak the language. Um, I'll leave again that, that decision as to whether these are examples of animals using language or not to you. But what is generally agreed that even if you accept this to be good enough to qualify as language use, that a an animal that's been learning a particular language all its life um, never gets to be better than an average human two or three year old. Um, now others would say, well, that's certainly true, but even then it doesn't mean that the animal can speak a language because we looked before with Hockett's um, idea of having a language having to have certain clear features, that in the forms of communication that these non-human animals use, um, you can find some of the features required to be a language, but you certainly can't find all of them. So for example, people have argued that you rarely or indeed possibly never find in these primate um, animals the concept of displacement. They don't really aren't really able to talk about things that are remote in space or time. They don't quite understand structured dependence, um, so it's not clear um, who should be tickling who, in that example, or who was chasing the dog. They don't quite understand um, that sort of um, syntactical point. And there isn't a lot of creativity. The non-human animals seem to only ever communicate using the same basic words, same basic structures. They don't spontaneously come up with a completely new um, sentence or phrase or piece of communication that isn't something that's been specifically taught to them before. So the debate goes on, but certainly um, some people would argue that language clearly is, as we define it, the, the complex communication system that it is. They believe it is uniquely human. Others would argue, well, no, animals can learn some very simple forms of language. Um, they can certainly communicate, but even beyond that, they actually are able to use language, even if it's a relatively simple, limited form of language. Um, but I'll leave that to the discussion there. Um, so just to compare, then, um, what you typically see in the non-human animals, uh, such as apes and children, and just contrast how different in quality they are, whether you actually believe that what the ape does is language or not, there is still, even if you do, there's still a massive level in quality of the language. So, as we said before, apes don't really have this idea of displacement. They mainly have references to the here, to the now, to the things that are around them. Whereas even um, relatively young children, you can refer to other times when they came, went somewhere before, that they'd like to go and visit something that isn't there right now. Apes tend to lack a syntactic structure. It's not clear um, who's, who's acting on the verb on what, so uh, who's tickling who. Whereas children, okay, they do make mistakes, but they have certainly, by four years, for example, a very clear idea of syntactic structure, and they're consistent in that. Um, to get apes to reach the level that they reach, they do really need explicit training with rewards and quite a lot of hours of training. Whereas, certainly in the first few years with children, they don't need explicit training. You just 
as long as the child is being socialised and being spoken to by its caregivers and getting a chance to play and interact, they seem to pick up language quite um, implicitly. Apes rarely ask questions, they don't seek out information using their language, they just state things or ask for things, whereas as we know children frequently ask questions, often um, questions are extremely difficult to answer, they're very um, abstract or philosophical in nature. Um, and apes very rarely use um, symbol spontaneously. They refer to an object because they see the object, whereas children can spontaneously use, use a new symbol. Um, okay, so as we've now drifted into what humans can do with language, I'm going to spend just a little bit of time talking about human language development. Obviously, this isn't um, a module on um, childhood development, um, so um, I won't spend too long looking at this, and perhaps this is something you have covered or will cover in um, other modules. But just focusing on how language develops in humans, again, helps us to look at this question of whether language is innate in humans or whether some form of language ability is innate, whether it all has to be something that we, that we learn from our environment. So a relatively old study, but um, an important one nonetheless, shows that there um, is preference in very, very young children, as, as young as only three days old, for human speech. If they hear human speech, particularly speech of a primary caregiver, such as their mother, then they are showing interest in trying to orientate to where the sound's coming from. Um, that's equally true if it's played through speakers and not actually because their mother's present. Um, whereas if you play other sounds, the babies don't show anything like as much interest. There's something very special about human speech um, that the baby seems to be aware of and try and pay attention to. Also, we can notice that human language development seems to be pretty consistent across all languages. Um, a number of studies have looked at this and it suggests, again, there's always individual differences in exactly what happens at what age certain things happen. But nearly every child, no matter what culture they're raised in, no matter what language um, they're um, exposed to, seem to start cooing very basic vowel sounds at around two months. And then, then they tend to babble by around four to nine months. And by 12 months, most children are producing a single one word utterance, such as mum or dad or no or yes, or more, or milk, or whatever it might be. And then moving on another six to 12 months, children by this stage tend to have two word utterances. So they're able to form kind of me, go. Um, so this idea of an, a subject and a verb, um, or, or, or a verb and an object. So they know what they're trying to do something to, or what they want to be given to. And by we get to three years, um, the children are tend tending to be able to have relatively long and complex sentences. Again, I'm not saying there aren't errors, I'm not saying there aren't um, confusions in the way that they speak, but actually, the, generally, they're able to, to exhibit and show quite a complex level of speech. And by around four and a half, five years, Actually, the speech is pretty comparable to adult speech. Yes, they still have a lot of vocabulary to learn, um, both in terms of, of nouns and verbs and, and other forms of speech, but actually the way they're able to construct sentences and put words together and come up with new ideas and new um, concepts is really very complex in a relatively short space of time. Um, so just moving on with this, idea and just looking in a little bit more detail, some other things that have suggested that the way humans come into the world able to learn language is really quite you know, consistent across different cultures and different languages. It's been noted in several different studies that all babies are able to differentiate the sounds, phonemes present in any human language. So, for example, we tend to know that um, 
if a Japanese person has been has learned, or has learned English the English language relatively late in life, they have a real problem pronouncing R's. They tend to make it sound like an L. And that's just because the Japanese language doesn't have a R sound in it anywhere. So if they come late in life, they find that they, it's very, able, very difficult for them to produce that sound and to even differentiate hearing a L or a R um, when they listen to English speak. But what's really interesting is at a relatively young age, between four and six months, Japanese babies are e easily able to differentiate between the L and R sounds. So the idea is that all babies are able to differentiate between these types of sounds. But then if you are exposed only to one particular language that doesn't have that exposure, or doesn't have that difference, rather, the, the babies actually lose that ability. And later on in life, even though they originally had it, you're not able to get that ability back again. Now this is a really powerful idea because it actually suggests that any human infant can come into this world basically able and prepared to distinguish and learn and be um, proficient in any other human language. And actually what language you learn just depends on what the social environment you're in. Even if I'm a, I'm a, I'm a um, Western British baby, if I'm born into a purely only speaking Japanese speaking society or adopted in at a very early age, then I'll grow up speaking fluent Japanese and if I learn English only late in life, I will have the same problems with L and R sounds that a native Japanese person would. Um, and then the other thing that seems quite interesting is that the rate of learning we have seems to be highly dependent on the environment. So this idea of if for some reason we're in a very unrich um, language environment, we're largely isolated, we don't have a lot of communication with our primary caregivers, things are done in silence, then we're very relatively slow to learn that language. And again, a lot of studies have looked at children born of um, deaf and, and, and or mute parents and how their um, language acquisition is perhaps slower. Yet, provided they just they go to school or in different nursery or in some social environment where they are exposed to the same spoken language, then their um, language acquisition um, picks back up and they um, learn at the rate of other children as well. And then some quite detailed work by Lennonberg back in the 60s basically suggested um, he was looking at this idea of being able to acquire a language and how easy and automatic it is provided we're just socialised in the language, we don't have to have formal lessons from a very early age of, of one 18 months, two years, we just soak it up and it's whatever language we're socialised to. He also developed this idea that actually when we are at that age, readily and quickly um, learning our uh, mother tongue, our primary um, language, we actually are very, very able to, at that age, have an additional two, three, four language acquisitions. So he suggested this idea that we have a natural sensitive period for language acquisition. Basically from the day we're born up until age of seven is a, is a relatively um, prudent estimate. Some people would say it's up to 12 or 14 or 16 um, is when um, the, uh, the, the sensitive period ends. That doesn't mean you can't learn language outside of that sensitive period. Um, clearly a lot of us do learn languages above the age of 12. Um, sometimes relatively late in life, but there's no doubt it's a lot more difficult, requires a lot more effort, and some of these um, abilities to distinguish or actually make certain sounds that are in your non-native tongue might by that stage be, be lost. Um, so again, it suggests that there may be a very common, consistent pattern across all human cultures of when and how um, we learn language. Okay, so just to illustrate that point a little bit, I'm going to introduce you to um, a little person now. And this is just a short video shot of um, a baby who is probably around nine months at the time of the video. And so you can just see him lying on a bed and he's doing what uh, most children will do at that age. 
which is babbling. So just practicing sounds and vocalizing um, things that don't particularly mean anything. So I'd just like you to watch this and listen to him. And um, afterwards, I'm going to just give you a little bit of time, perhaps, to try and guess what you think this um, baby's mother mother's tongue is. So what do you think the primary language that this baby has been socialized in up to the age he is now at nine months? So I'll just let you watch this. <laughs> Okay, I don't know um, whether you were able to make a decision as to what language you think um, is his mother's tongue, is his native socialised language. Um, probably a lot of you might have just said English, because he does sound um, very familiar to um, babies that we may have come across in um, the British um, culture in the British language, but um, what I'm going to do now is play a second video um, where he's not making so much noise, um, and in fact you can hear his mother speaking to him, and um, it's quite quiet, you might not be able to hear it, but I'll let you listen and see if after this you can um, decide perhaps what his uh, mother tongue is. La la la. La la la. Okay, so you've now watched the second video. I'm not sure whether many of you could hear it, but I hopefully you could hear his mum say things like fala conmigo and uh, chira saborka. Um, work phrases like that, uh, which clearly are not English. So this baby wasn't um, born to an English-speaking mother, or at least not a native English-speaking mother, and um, his general socialisation so far hasn't been um, within the English language. Um, now, the language his mother speaking is actually Portuguese. Again, I don't necessarily expect you to know that. But the fact is that this baby is making the same babbling, da-da-da, Bar, bar, bar sounds that an English baby would make, that actually a Japanese baby would make, that um, an Indian baby would make, Chinese baby, what have you. The fact that this is um, a baby that's been mainly socialised in the Portuguese language doesn't affect how he goes ba 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 da da da. It's just consistent across languages. So this was just a little example to reinforce some of the points I was making earlier about how language seems to develop in all humans at a very early age and in a similar way irrespective of the language that you end up speaking. Okay, so we're going to move on now to a slightly different topic and that's one of how the language that we do speak and the rules that are particularly unique to that language or some of the uh, things that we do specifically in that language might actually be able to affect the way we think and the way we make decisions. Okay, so the first real thoughts around whether language might influence other cognitive processes such as thought um, is often referred to as the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. Now, in fact, Sapir and Whorf came up with these ideas independently. They never um, particularly collaborated or worked together, but because both had very similar positions or theories, um, we often combine their two thoughts into uh, a single hypothesis. And basically the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis suggests that the language we speak impacts the way we think. Um, this is often referred to as linguistic determinism the language we speak determines how we think and how we um, may make judgments, for example.
Now that's a very strong form of um, or interpretation of um, the Sapir Wharf um, idea, and a slightly looser version we could call linguistic relativism. So that is the idea that the language, specific language we speak, it influences the way we think, but it doesn't make it fundamentally different um, than if we spoke another language. So the idea is that this influence comes possibly directly or indirectly by the way we perceive the world and therefore describe the world maybe, and also very indirectly by our memory processes. But they both are trying to suggest there is at least some influence of the way we think and undertake other cognitive processes based on the language that we um, naturally speak. Um, an alternative position, of course, is that the language we speak has no effect whatsoever on the way we think. Um, now, there's been several kind of, again, theoretical or, or descriptive ideas of this. So one by Hunt and Agnoli suggested that, well, because of the way we use language, basically the language we speak will define what is easy to communicate. For example, if a word or concept is easily communicated in a language, we're more likely to use it and therefore we're more likely to think about that concept. Um, an example might be when we speak a different language, often they, there is no direct translation of a particular concept. So in Dutch, for example, they have this idea of something being gezellig, and it kind of means cosy, pleasant, nice, a good ambience, a good atmosphere, but there's no simple and direct way of translating it. And so that might influence a little bit the way we think about um, certain concepts or certain processes. A specific experimental example of this perhaps came um, in a series of interviews conducted with some uh, Japanese um, families living in the US. They were both interviewed in English and Japanese. And when they were asked um, some specific questions, or at least to comment on um, some concepts or some ideas, um, the answers they gave tended to vary very much as to whether they were speaking in English or Japanese. So the example often given is that they were asked to talk about what they do when their wishes conflict with their families. And if they were asked this in Japanese, then they would reply such as with things like saying, well, it's a time of great sadness, obviously this is very upsetting, and then talk about how they feel about that situation occurring. Um, whereas if they're asked in, in, in English, particularly in American culture, um, what happens in that sort of situation, they would reply, well, I just do what I want, what, what I preferred. And the idea here is that when they're in sp speaking and thinking in Japanese, they're very much aware of the very collective nature of Japanese society and Japanese culture, and therefore they're just wanting everything to be harmonious, they want to agree what should be done. So they're focusing on how disagreement actually disrupts harmony and, and upsets them. Whereas in English, particularly in the US, there's a very individu individualistic culture that life is what you make of it, you go out and, and make things happen. And here they're emphasizing that kind of cultural perspective by saying if there's a conflict, then they just do what they think is best. Again, perhaps not the best or strongest support for this idea, but perhaps at least example that something is different going on um, when the same individual is thinking about something in two different languages. Um, a contrast of this comes from some work done by Pinker, and he was trying to argue that thought is not restricted by language. So he looked at um, some Native Americans um, from the Apache tribe, and looked at how they express certain concepts in Apache. And this is a language that is very diff different to our own, and it's very difficult to directly translate, translate concepts from English into Apache. But if he asked them to talk about it being a relatively mild spring, the fact that things are beginning to free, uh, sorry, thaw, unfreeze, 
then in English you might say something like, well, you wouldn't say something like, it's a dripping spring. That doesn't really sound like a, a, a reasonable expression in English, but it is a direct translation of perhaps, um, or a direct translation of perhaps what an Apache person might say in using the phrase gar nor tor, um, then that's basically saying as water or like water or springs, whiteness moves downwards. So you can see that if you translate it directly, it does kind of imply the thing we're beginning to thaw. Whiteness, meaning frost, snow, ice, um, is moving downwards as if it was water or spring, i.e. it's melting. So the, the concept is basically still there, even though you're using a very different way of constructing that concept. Another example often cited is how they refer to the English concept of a man walking, he walks, they would use a, a direct translation of a solitary masculinity, legginess proceeds. Again, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but if you break it down, well, solitary means singular on their own, masculinity means male or man, so that's the he part, it's a single man, it's not we, them, her, she. And legginess proceeds, again, proceeding, moving forward, legginess means, you know, on their legs, so maybe that does translate as walking. So he's saying, really, that although the specific expressions used and the way things translate may be very, very different between languages, actually, fundamentally, what they're describing is the same conception. Um, in contrast, some studies with people who speak um, different languages, here's one of um, what occurs in the Philippines, there's a suggestion that there are multiple words for rice in the Philippines, but, na but no natural word for snow. Now, this is, again, contrary to the Sapir Wharf, or in fact, not really contrary, it's actually almost the opposite of the Sapir Wharf um, idea. Because this is suggesting not that the language restricts you thinking about snow or rice, but if you discuss snow with someone from the Philippines, they're probably aware of the concept. It's not as if just because they don't have a word, they don't understand what it is. But it's actually suggesting that the environment they have, the way they think about things, actually is reflected, reflected in their language. So this is the idea that rice is very important in the Philippines. It's the main food source, main staple diet of the Philippine people, and therefore having lots of words describe them, different varieties of rice, or the different stages of rice as it matures, is actually really, relatively important. Whereas describing something that doesn't naturally occur in the Philippines, such as snow, means that you don't really need a single word to describe it. So this is suggesting that actually thought affects language. The, the things that occur commonly in your experience and in your thoughts will actually determine what words occur in your language. So it's almost the opposite of the Sapir Wharf hypothesis, or at least that's what um, the authors argue. So let's look at some evidence now that perhaps does support Sapir Wharf, or at least a form of Sapir Wharf. And this is um, a study done with um, on the topic of categorical perception. Um, so they took English speakers and um, a tribe of people from Indonesia called the Burinma who speak a language um, that is peculiar to them. And what's interesting about this particular culture is they only have five basic colour terms. They don't have the range of colours, at least in terms of words, in the English language. Um, in particular, they have a term called nol, which basically describes green, blue, purple and a word called war, which describes yellow, oranges and browns. And the idea is, given that they have different terms for um, different colour shades, will how they actually compare them and describe them um, differ from the English speakers. In particular, there's a general belief or, or, or general finding in cognitive psychology that individuals from any culture will find it much easier to discriminate between stimuli belonging to different categories 
than between stimuli within the, within the same category. So bearing that in mind, what the authors did is basically showed both the English speakers and the Burinmo um, three different colours, and everyone saw the same um, shades of colour, and they were just asked to know which two were the most similar. Now, assuming you're not a Burinmo speaker or indeed a speaker of a, another language that has quite different perceptions or at least concepts of colour groupings, you'll probably say that the middle one and the one on the left of the screen are both kind of greeny, grey, blue colours and therefore they're most similar and the one on the right hand side of the screen, the purple, is actually quite different. And again, if you look at the, the general way that people tend to describe colours in, um, in the English language, you'll see that those colours patterns actually fall into particular forms of the spectrum that relate to green, just about blue and purple. Whereas the Brinmo people would generally say that the middle one and the right hand one were the most similar and the one on the left is very different. And this is because the two on the right fall into this idea of being null colours, they're kind of bluey, purpley colours, whereas the war fall into the yellow, green, browny colours. The suggestion is that at least the way we conceptualise colour in our language, the way we group them, actually means that we give different answers to the question of which of the two most similar. However, one criticism of this study is that whilst the results are the results, does it confuse the idea of the effect of thinking in language with whether actually language shapes thought perception. No one's suggesting, for example, that neither the English speakers nor the Barimmo can't see three very different shades up there. It's just the way we group things makes us think about possibly, um, well, it, it alters what we, what, we, what we interpret as the word similar. The similar is, how do we group things together? So it's a slightly circular argument, some might say, as to whether you're picking up a difference in actually language affecting thought, or the question is just being, um, is making you think about how you group things in your language. Um, there's a similar study done with the Dani people of the Papua New Guinea um, by Roche, which um, perhaps might come but it might be interesting for you to think about compared to this study. So given that there's some doubt there about um, you're definitely getting an effect of different language speakers um, on, in their responses, the question is what is that really telling us in terms of how language is or isn't shaping thought um, or is how we think shaping language. So I'm going to talk about a couple of different studies by Casasanto colleagues. The first one is looking at how English speakers use, often use spatial terms for the temporal domain, i.e. time. So they talk about moving the truck forward. Um, that's clearly about moving the truck physically forward, moving it in space. But you also talk about moving the meeting forward. So that's moving the meeting in time. Um, changing its position in time. But we don't seem to do very often think this the other way around. So we don't use temporal terms to describe movements in space. So you don't say things like they changed the truck to earlier. That just doesn't make sense. It doesn't mean that they moved its position to be closer to you as you got to it earlier, for example. So in this study, what they did is show participants' lines of different sizes and growing for different durations. And they were just asked to indicate what the final length of the line was, before it disappeared from the screen, or potentially how long the stimulus had been on the screen. And what they found is that for people estimating how long things have been on the screen, 
then actually how long the line was by the time it disappeared from the screen affected their judgment of time. Whereas if they were asked to make a judgment of the length of the line, then they weren't influenced by anything other than the actual length of the line. So this is suggesting that people are using spatial information to alter their estimates of time, but not the other way around, which again perhaps might come from this idea that we often use spatial concepts and ideas when we're thinking about time. Um, again, not particularly um, compelling evidence, but, but an interesting finding nonetheless. So then we move on to a, a follow-up study by Cazanto, and here he uses the um, feature of the Greek language, the fact that um, in Greek, people differentiate between um, length and volume. So people, if they want to talk about things going on for a large time, they'll talk about the word macris, meaning long. But they use the term megalos for large, or poly for much. So they will talk about volume concepts. So in this study, participants were again showing these lines growing for different durations but with, a, with an added uh, condition where they actually saw a contain, container filling up with liquid. And again, people were asked to estimate how long the symbol, the container filling, or the line growing was on the screen. And what you saw is that the English um, participants or English speakers were, again, distorting their time estimates based on the actual physical length of the line they saw. Um, similar to the earlier study, so a continuation of that effect, but they weren't having their time estimates distorted by how full the container was. Whereas for the Greek speakers, they had the opposite effect. How long the line was wasn't distorting their time estimates in that condition, but how full the um, container was was affecting their estimate of time. So you, things, meetings don't go on for a long time in Greek, but they go on for a much time, or a large amount of time. Um, so you're using volume concepts to describe time. And that, again, that linkage seems to be spilling over into this uh, judgment task. So that certainly shows that there is a connection of at least some sort between how we mentally represent time i.e. in English language, we tend to represent time um, in spatial length, um, go on for a long time, move things forward and back in time. But in Greek, we talk about things going on for much time or a large amount of time. Um, so therefore, we tend to think about time as a volume of uh, capacity, if you like. So there's clearly a linkage there, but the question is, is that linkage actually causal? Is it because we're thinking in this language that we now have really different concepts of time and they affect us and our other judgments? Well, what's certainly true is because of what we've said or, or what we think is true, what we've said about the way all human babies seem to develop through the same stages and could learn any language provided they're exposed to it and socialised to it early off in life. That we all start off from any different culture, from any different language. We all start off the same as children before we are um, linguistic, i.e. when we're pre-linguistic. But as we learn language, perhaps it adjusts our way of thinking. And we create a conceptual map around a concept based on how that language conceptualizes something. And that could at least explain some of these ways that language does seem to be looking as though it impacts on thought. But if it's this very loose relationship that's developed relatively late in life, the question is, can we create a different conceptual map around a concept if we just have some experience of it and we're exposed to it? So in a follow-up study, Cassandra used the same filling paradigm as before with both native Greek and English speakers, 
But prior to undertaking the task, participants had 30 minutes practicing distance or volume met metaphors. So a sneeze is longer, shorter than a vacation. Well, clearly a, a sneeze is likely to be shorter than a vacation. It happens for split seconds, maybe a second at the most, whereas a vacation or holiday is at least a day long, often a week or two long. And if they were in the um, distance category, that's what they would practice. However, you could also put English speakers in the volume uh, metaphor category, where you had to decide whether a sneeze is more or less than a vacation. Now, conceptually or logically, that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to native English speakers. But I think if you're forced to guess between those two terms, you would generally think because a sneeze is shorter, it, it must in some way have less to it, less content to it or less duration to it, whatever it might be, than a vacation. So you're likely to be forced into comparing these two items based on their volume, whether it's more or less of it. So the, the English speakers who practice these two different types of metaphors um, actually both showed time estimate distortions um, for both forms of the task. So the English speakers are now, at least in the, in the second category, are showing the same time distortions based on uh, length of line as they showed before this practice, because that's a very natural association of cognitive mapping to do. But because you've now just been deliberately forced also to be thinking about duration as a volume idea, in this particular group of the individuals that have been exposed to those practice uh, metaphors, you're now getting the English people showing a volume distortion as well, as if they were native Greek speakers. So now this is really interesting because this suggests that even though a native English speaker perhaps doesn't have a natural conceptual linkage between volume and time, by artificially practicing a task that emphasises the link between volume and time, you could artificially force people to activate some linkage between volume and time and then you get the same distortions as if they were speaking a language that naturally equated volume and time. So it's quite a complex new series of studies there. I won't explain them any more because we're running out of time, but I like you to think about what's actually been done here and what's what this this series of different studies all mean when they're put together and what they perhaps tell us about language and thought. So just to summarize then um, what we've covered in this lecture and what's covered in a lot more detail in the directed reading, you should be able to discuss and define what is a language and how is a language different from other forms of comprehension. You should also be able to discuss and describe the basics of language comprehension and production, both written and spoken. Again, I didn't cover that in the lecture, but that's covered very well in your textbooks and in the directed reading. And also, you should be able to debate the issue whether primates can use language or not, in the way that humans can, and why this debate is important, what it tells us about human language, and if we think they can or if we think they can't. Then finally, we moved on to the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, and so you should be familiar with that as a concept and be able to describe it and also evaluate um, whether what the evidence is for and against this idea of the language we speak determine how we think and how we make judgments, etc. And finally, because of the work we did looking at primate language and because of how language develops in humans, I'd also like you to be able to discuss and debate an ongoing debate as to whether language is something that is innate in humans or whether it's something that's learnt or whether it's some combination of the two. Okay, so that ends the cognition lecture for today. And as I said, it was the last one. It also ends the series of cognition lectures um, for this module. But I'm sure we'll um, meet again to talk about um, some of the work that you might uh, be doing based on these lectures and the reading that you'll be doing, and perhaps some of the issues you're coming up against as we start trying to um, think about preparing for the um, exam and the way we might have to present information in some of our revision lectures.
Okay, well that's it for now. Um, so thank you for listening.